Faith and Family Nights. So we got asked about this by Mark uh, quite a while ago. And uh, he wanted us, I think, in the beginning. And of course... Hold that up, sweetheart. Of course. Thank you, dear. You're welcome. Of course, uh, I freaked out and said, oh, I'm working too much, working too much. So we, we were, were the last. <laughs> so, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come and speak. So it was going through our heads about, you know, what are we going to present? How are we going to talk about this? And uh, God just dropped it in me about ask questions. You ask questions. So for all those who are raising families, any age really, but raising families, one of the smartest things I think a church could do is line up the 60s, 70s, and 80s up mm -hmm. here. True. And just go through and ask questions. Okay? True. True. Nobody did it perfectly. None of us. Yeah. But we had strong points, right? And different strong points for different folks. So that was kind of the beginning of it. And uh, when Jennifer was here, we, were, we actually got an evening to sit down with her and just visit with her. It's rare. I hadn't seen her since Christmas. So um, she said, you know what, that's a pretty good idea. She said, why don't you just, to her mother, why don't you just solicit questions from a few couples and then, you know, we'll approach it that way. So I thought it was great, and that's what yeah. we're doing. Yeah. So <clears throat> a couple of the things that, that came up during worship, because um, this is really not a prepared presentation by any stretch of the imagination. Um, well, we've been preparing for 44 years. <laughs> really, that's true. That's true. That's true. So, you know, we get asked questions a lot about, you know, how'd you raise your kids and all that, because our kids are doing pretty good, and we're very pleased with who they are and where they are and what they've done in their life. And they've been great blessings to us. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, when I think about it, I think, you know, I did some of it blind. I mean, it was just God. I did things that I didn't know I did right, and I did some things wrong. Um, and if the four of them were here, they could attest to that. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that came in to me tonight when we were in worship was that song about getting in His presence. So one of the things I want to say to you is, how about Him getting in your presence? That's, that's what he wants. He wants to be present with us all the time, even more than we want to be present with him all the time. And that really is a kind of a theme that carried us through our years. And uh, there's a whole story behind how we met and got married and how all this happened. And some of you may have heard it before, but you know, you can throw a uh, bubble gum at me if uh, you've heard it before when I'm telling the story, but I'm not going to start there. Um, just know this. You didn't come from your parents. You came through your parents. Mm -hmm. yes. You've heard it preached, and it's very true. You were a seed in God's mind before anything. Right. Before anything. And he brought you through a designed couple. So that means there ain't no mistakes. That's right, right. None. And uh, remember that with your children. Okay? They came through you, but they came from God. Mm -hmm. They're God's artwork. Mm -hmm. They're His masterpiece. So are you. And you need to make sure that when you're parenting, you treat them that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, two microphones. That's okay. dangerous. I want to give an offering to your ministry. <laughs> a big, fat offering. KJ, I told, Robert will cancel the I check. told you to take the batteries out of that one, didn't I? Be nice, be nice. But, you know, it's very true. You, you know, you, in the, if you're reading the Mirror Bible, you can't get past it, right? But it's absolutely true. We are all his masterpiece, his artwork. 
and we've got to keep that in mind all the time. So, <clears throat> you want to go from there? Oh, I get to take it? Well, there for a while. My anyway. interpretive dance I got this, I'm going to put the timer already. on. I'm going to put the timer on. We have a joke around here for those who don't know that I'm always willing to do the interpretive dance section of the program. It is not happening tonight, so stay in your seats. Um, I'm the only one that's ever seen that. That's true. <laughs> wow. It just took a whole different turn like that. Like that. Okay, KJ, can we get this? I need this mic turned off quickly. I pictured Pastor Chris sitting in Florida watching going, why? Why did we invite those two up here? Mark Elvin, you're in trouble. <laughs> But I'll be back. I always say I might not be invited back, but that's not a good confession. And here I am yet again, so apparently I wasn't as bad as I thought. So, thank you. Yes, thank you. That's why I fit in so well here, right? So, Robert and I have been married 44 years this September. And I, the, the very short version of the story is I met him he introduced me to the Lord two weeks later. He proposed the week after that, and we got married three months or four months later. So everybody thought I was nuts, both for getting saved, for getting engaged to somebody I didn't know, and for getting married so quickly. But here we are, as happy as can be, right? And don't forget, we were in Kentucky, and you were marrying an Italian. I was marrying an Italian, according to my grandmother. Kentucky, Are you one Kentucky of them Italians? Yeah. And I had a three and a half year old precious beautiful girl, mm -hmm. Jen, who um, I got told all the time, she looks a lot more like her dad than she does you. I'm sorry <laughs> I have to say it. Like, yes, she does. She's just like him. <laughs> So we then went on to have three more kids. Our youngest is 30-something. I don't do math. I just know he's <laughs> mid-30s. I try not to even think about it. I will say I was shocked that she said it was your 50th because I thought, I'm not kidding, that she was going to say it's your 40th. Yeah, right. yeah. I truly did. I went, 50? Yeah. Wow. So... You guys are like yeah. maybe supposed to be up here next week talking about how to look and act young because I truly <laughs> thought 40, <sighs> which means I could be your mother. So I'm kind of glad to hear you're 50, but I could still be your mother. So let's just leave it right there. Man. So we did ask for questions. I'm just going to dive in because there are a lot of questions that we had. So... Um, Robert and I raised our children for 20 years in Kentucky. Pretty much all of them raised. The youngest was 14. Then we came back to his hometown of Syracuse, and we've been here for 22 years. So, and that math doesn't add up. So it was 22 and 22, I think. At any rate, I'm still trying to fit in here, a southern girl trying to fit in <laughs> in New York. So we had this question. And I loved, and these are all going to be anonymous. I love that she said, this will be a hard one because you and Robert must have never fought and still never do. <laughs> so discerning. I just wish for that I could call her out. Watch out for the lightning strike. And say, you have a discerning spirit. But how did you handle disagreements, offenses in front of your kids? It seems difficult. We want to show balance, showing you unity, not being dishonest about our feelings, but also wanting to model a good example of conflict resolution. But sometimes it's not a good example. So we talked about this <laughs> last night, a little tired, and it went something like this. What do you think we should really talk about this tomorrow night, just have the questions? I don't know, is that what you think we should do? <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, maybe that is what we... Okay, that's what I thought we were going to do. Okay, let's just calm down. Let's just dial it down a little bit. 
let's just realize we're probably extremely tired. It's been a busy time. That was me talking. Yes. <laughs> Anybody in the room believe that? And Thank my, you, John. My daughter's sitting on the couch next to me, and she went, oh, well, okay, so this is going to be good. <laughs> But the thing is, when we get like that, we end up immediately laughing about it, going, wow, okay, so we're not talking about harmony this week, are we? So I think that's the key to it. The key is to recognize you're being ridiculous right now over a really stupid thing. So let's turn it around. The enemy's trying to poke our humanness and our emotions of, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm whatever, cranky, yeah. are coming to the surface. We don't mean it. It's not in our heart. Don't take offense at it, but just laugh it off, dial it down. If you need to smile and go, I'll be back in just a minute, and go pray in the other room, <laughs> or lay hands on him, her or him, <laughs> suddenly... But my favorite thing to do that I learned from a well-known pastor and his wife is to say, Robert, I find no fault in you. Because it makes me go, wait, how do I find fault in the masterpiece that God created? Right? I can't find fault in that. And it's usually me being overly sensitive, me being tired, me being hungry. Me, do you know what I mean? Our emotions have to take a back seat. We have to stop the emotional roller coaster. And we really shouldn't feel that we have the right to just bleh all over our spouse or our friend or our kids. We really don't have that right to just spew it all out and go, you love me. I know you're still going to love me. You're never going to leave me. So I'm just going to say whatever I feel like saying and walk out of the room. You can't do that to each other. No. Right. Right? right? So for us, a disagreement, when Pastor Chris first invited me to go to Panama City, I immediately saw myself driving from New York to Panama City, Florida. And I went in the living room and I said, honey, Pastor Chris wants me to come speak there. And I think I want to drive. And he went, no, you're not. Which to me is like, I'm at a 12 now because he's telling me I'm not. <laughs> Honestly. And I opened my mouth to say something like, well, and I said, would you do me a favor? Would you just take tonight and pray about it? And I'm telling you, sometimes I shock myself with a calm <laughs> response. And he said, okay, I'll pray about it. I said, all right, we'll leave it there. And I walk out of the room with my hand on my mouth so I don't, like, dig or poke or... Well, you know, God showed me. I just walked out of the room, and the next morning, he came in and said, you know what, you can drive to Florida if you want to. God's given me total peace about that. Go ahead. I think it's nuts, but if you want to do it, I have no issue. So now you have to understand that we've been married for 44 years. But with all her travel alone, it's more like 34. Okay. So she goes for days, you know. Robert said this at Mike and Lisa Teed's house at our 40th. We all laughed hysterically. And he thinks it's the funniest joke ever to talk about me being a gone <laughs> on trips alone so much, but it might be the secret to our happy marriage, too. No he, he gets a break. He's okay. like, yes, 10 days? Hey, if they want you longer, you stay, honey. You do what God says. As long as the house is clean when you come home, it's okay, right? And it, I, guys, I come home to a clean house, laundry caught up, groceries in. Like, I don't come home and pay the price for being gone. It's all done. He's well, taking I need clean care. underwear. I have to eat. <laughs> and I don't like smells. <laughs> I'm trying to paint this wonderful picture of you, and you just destroyed it. They know better. It. They know better. So it isn't always that calm, though. And there are times being married to an Italian man. Yeah, yeah that's true. I'm one sixteenth Italian, if you count 
a great, 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 great grandfather from the 1600s, then yes, I am Italian, which I do count. And that was Papino? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I don't even remember. Yeah. And I'm a very passionate person. He's a passionate person. We go after everything 150%. And so there's bound to be some, I don't think we should do that. You think we should. You're pushing to get it done anyway. And now we have a conflict because I'm not feeling it. So what do we do? We pray. We pray. And we ask God, what do you want? We need you in the middle of this. I don't agree with him 100%. I don't agree with him. But he's really digging in, going, I know it's this. And so we pray, right? Yeah. And if we don't get an answer and we're still not in agreement, then we pray some more. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. it's a rush, I need your answer right now, then the answer is no. You're not going, you're not doing, you're, not, you're just going to stay steady until we hear from God, right? Yeah. And, and it, that's served us very well. It has, and in front of the kids over the years... You know, we didn't have those, we didn't have arguments. You know, if it started that way, we'd hush up. But we also always told our kids when we screwed up, hey, you know, mom and dad messed up on this. We shouldn't have been having that conversation in front of you guys. Mm -hmm. And then I did a lot of apologizing to my children over the years for things that I messed up on, mm -hmm. including disciplining them incorrectly or yeah. for something, holding them responsible for something they didn't do, and I found out later, okay? They got to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I'm human, that she's human, you know, and that their ultimate authority is God. Mm -hmm. that, that's what we tried to impress upon them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I want to get off but the... But if, if we had a disagreement in front of the kids, our rule was we make up in front of yeah. the kids. Yeah. They're going to see us kiss and hug and, honey, I'm sorry I was an idiot and I shouldn't have said or I shouldn't have done. And the kids would, you know, to the point of, ooh, gross, stop, that kind of. But that's when I knew we made up well because the kids were like, knock it off. Right? Best part so, of the argument right there. But, but it's important that they see that you can have a disagreement. But you can't, it can't be mom and dad have been mad and not talking for three days right. or three hours. No, right. You got to get to the bottom of it for, your, for right. your sake and for your kids' sake. And when the siblings got into it, we made them hug each other, forgive each other, hug each other, right. forced it. Forced. If I had to push them together, I pushed them together, you know. But it, what that did is it really built a strong relationship between the siblings. I love the way my kids get along. Yeah. Yeah. Our kids plan family vacation. They get together at Christmas because we have to have a holiday together. There's 17 of us. They insist on it. They make it work. They fly in. They drive in. They take off work. And at Christmas, they discuss family vacation plans. So it worked. They love each other, like almost to a fault. Yeah. And they, um, they love God. Right? Yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're very good parents and uh, can't, couldn't be happier. So we watched our son, um, one of our sons is a pastor in New York, near New York City. And we watched them when they got first stepped into those positions of leadership, because his wife is also. We'd come down, we'd go to church, go back to their house to have a meal, and all of a sudden I'm, where'd Gabe, where'd Gabe and Ashley go? And then they come out of the bedroom. I'm like, what's going on? Oh, some church stuff we had to take care of. I said, oh, everything okay? Yeah, it was just an issue somebody in church was having. And I finally one day said, well, what are you doing in the bedroom? They said, well, we're not going to discuss it in front of anybody. Okay. We don't want the kids to hear it. We don't want you guys to hear it. Good. They get up, leave the family gathering, go in the bedroom, do the discussion, and come back. Yeah. They don't stand there and go, you know what? You don't know Mark and Amy, so we'll just tell you what the problem was. Right? right? They, do, they don't dishonor those people. They go into the other room, and my, children, my grandchildren have never said, 
See that guy? Boy, does he have issues. My dad's mad at him. None of that never comes out of them because they don't expose them to that. Which I think is such an honorable thing to do, but what a great lesson to teach your kids. So we had had times early on before we learned, don't have those discussions. I love somebody said, if you're going to have your pastor for dinner, make sure he's there. (laughs) Get it? So we would say, okay, family meeting time. Man, we screwed up. We sat and talked about, we didn't like what pastor said, and we talked against it, and we shouldn't have done it, and we're so sorry, and we need you guys to forgive us, and we're going to pray for pastor and for us right now. And you don't always do that. You sometimes screw up, but every time we could, we did that. Every time that God called us on it, we did it. Mm -hmm. So we learned, you know what, these family meetings are kind of, like we need, we should be moving on from this. We should have learned from this. We should stop having to do this. Yeah. yeah. And that was important to our children, they have said. That was important to them. So this, you know, this, our, your relationships, are, are, everything's a love relationship, right? We all believe in love. We all talk about it. We sing about it. We preach about it. Hopefully we walk it out each and every day. But really... What's your definition of love? You know, we know uh, the Greek has four terms for love, depending on what the object is. Um, And we know that, you know, God's kind of love is an unconditional love, which is pretty hard for us to fathom, but it is. But love to me, um, and what's kept me on the track that I've been on all my life, is that it's a commitment. So when Jean and I met, um, things happened fast, but the first weekend we met, uh, I was working for a hotel company, and we're sitting, and that, my office was at one of the hotels. So they could- at one of the hotels, sorry. Um, and we just, we're sitting by the pool and just talking. And I have no idea where this came from, because it didn't come out of me. Obviously, it came from God. I just started talking about, what a Christian marriage is like. What do you think a Christian marriage is? You know, what do you think a marriage is? Well, I'm a believer. Here's what I think it is. And we talked about that. Um, She said, well, you know, it's 50-50. I said, you're wrong. I said, do you really want to be in a relationship where the other person's only given 50%? Mm -hmm. No, it's 100-100. It's a commitment. The commitment I made to her on our wedding day was absolute, period, till death do us part. And I was going to keep that promise no matter what. And so was she. So once that's established, you live that out, and your kids know that. Mm -hmm. Your children live in the peace of knowing that that's the situation. Now, we homeschooled, so... We had a leg up on a lot of things. And I, you know, I watch my grandkids now with her from 14 years old down to one and a half. And um, the four, they're all, four of them are in a public school in New York State. And I can't imagine me having a parent in this era right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I was pretty, you know, hard on them. I was pretty tough. I was tender when I needed to be. But I wanted them to toe the line. I wanted them to turn out right. For their benefit, not so people could pat me on the back. It was for their benefit. Right. And, and as they grew, they understood that. But, uh, you know, the things that you're up against today, you younger uh, couples with children in and, and, and public school, it's, it's just tough. Public school was tough back then. Now, we homeschooled uh, Jennifer from, uh, what was the second grade? second grade on all the way through high school, and then she went to Rama. So that was a breeze. I mean, she was the most trouble-free child in the world. I mean, I, th- I think she gave me a problem once in her life, you know. But, uh, and the, then she cried and ran, will you please forgive me? I was ugly. I was awful. I'm like, yeah, well, you were 13. It's okay. That was it. Yeah. It crushed her that she did it. I'm not kidding. Had not another trouble with her. Yeah. 
And then the boys, we homeschooled uh, from the beginning. And then when they got to high school age, we put them in the Christian school at the church that we went to in Kentucky. And uh, really, one of the one of the major reasons I put them in school, we put them in school, was because they were good in baseball. And we were told, you know, if you don't get them in a public school or in a school program where they get noticed, you might not get any college offers. So, and all that did work out. So that was great. But um, uh, when they went to the Christian school, every problem that existed in the public school also existed in the Christian school. Yeah. yeah. You know, just because it's got a cross on the outside of the building doesn't mean it's utopia. Right? So it's important that no matter what education atmosphere your child is in, okay, that you back up what your beliefs with, with your children at home. Mm -hmm. I used to take little opportunities like Jennifer was small. We, we lived in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. And... Um, I was planting flowers one day. So I just took the opportunity to talk about sowing and reaping, you know. And we were talking about different things. And she said to me, well, Dad, it's not really that way. I said, what do you mean? She's like five. I said, what do you mean it's not like that? Well, she was in a preschool program. She goes, well, my teacher said it's like this. Well, the light went off in me and the trigger in my Italian. <laughs> and that's when we started discussing homeschooling. Okay. So... I did that with Robert, too. He was the next born. Five, uh, Jennifer was five when he was born. And um, we're planting seeds one day. And he was taking it all in. He's, he's a processor like his father, and he was thinking it through. And we went out to eat at uh, Burger King or something, and they had the seeds on the buns, you know, the sesame seeds. So he's picking the seeds off. I says, what are you doing, Robert? They, you know, you eat those all the time. He goes, no, I'm going to save those seeds and plant them. We can grow cheeseburgers. <laughs> Do you think what you say to your kids hits home? You know, it does. It does. So that same child, years later, after college, gets a great job. He's a CPA. He's working for a firm that only handles high net worth clients. So one day, I don't know what happened because I don't pay attention to stock market and financial stuff, but something bad happened in the economy. I'll leave it there. I don't know what it was, but it affected everybody. It was a 700 point drop on, on what? There you go, which means nothing to me. 700 point drop in the stock market, is that what you said? Sounds awful, right? So we're out on the boat fishing, and Robert all of a sudden gets this Do you think we really did any good as parents? I said, What? I go, our kids are grown, they're doing great. No, do you think anything we taught them really stuck? Oh. <laughs> Did they really get anything from us? Really, think about it. And I'm sitting there going, are you kidding? That was hard, and our kids turned out great. <laughs> they're fine. Yeah. We did awesome. We're still here, they're still talking to us. We did good. <laughs> so we get back to the house, Robert goes right upstairs, gets on his computer, and I hear him up there, like all Italian men do, weeping a little bit. And I'm really picking on Italian men tonight. You so, thought I got friends here. <laughs> <laughs> I said, honey, what's going on? He said, Robert just sent me an email, probably at the exact moment we were out on the boat. I said, okay, what is it? He said, Dad, I'm sitting here watching these grown men and women fall apart because of the stock market drop. They're all a mess. They don't know what to do. They're panicking. And all I can hear in my head is your booming voice singing that song you always sang to us as kids. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, he was, what, almost 30 years old. But at the exact moment that he's questioning, God sets it up, and Robert said, and Dad, I'm at peace. Stayed at peace. This is the same, same boy, grown man, that every night sings the same song we used to sing at night. I love you, Lord, to his kids. Every single night, if he's out on a mission, he FaceTimes so that they can hold up the phone, and sing with Daddy every single night. 
these kids, his kids are going to grow up and serve God, right? There's no doubt. But there were times, I have to say, that when our kids were growing up, you get pressure from other people. For those of you who don't homeschool, I'm sure you get feel some pressure. I should be homeschooling. For some of you that are, you might get pressure to put your kids in school. And I had a rule. Let's meet when my youngest is 21, and let's see who is right, me or you. <laughs> let's just find out if I did right by my kids or you did right. But between now and then, let's just let them be kids and have fun and be together and we'll be friends yeah. and we won't compare children and what their abilities are, right? So important. You got to do what God's calling you to do right. as a family. And we were under attack when we decided to homeschool because we pulled Jennifer out of the Christian school, church school for second grade. And that was a lot of, a lot of talk about that. People didn't like it, but you know, we weren't going to do what people wanted. We were going to do what we felt led to do, you know. And um, I, I didn't get a telegram from God about it, but I just knew in my heart that um, in order for me to be the influence I'm supposed to be on my children and for Jean to influence them the way she's supposed to, we had to have them in our clutches, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it, it caught, it, down the road... <laughs> It made us such a tight-knit group. And I know there's homeschool families here, and you're, you're doing it now. But when your kids get older and they start going to college and they start moving away, it's tough because you, you're so ingrained with one another. You're mm -hmm. so tied in that you actually go through some separation anxiety. You know, and I did that when we sent uh, Jennifer to Rama. Uh, some of you know Len and Kathy Mink, and they were great friends. And their daughter and Jennifer were in youth group together in Cincinnati. And um, they took her to a couple of camp meetings out at Rama. And she just got it from God that she was going to go to Rama when she got done with high school. And uh, I wasn't crazy about the idea, you know. But And I won't go through the whole story. But when we dropped her off, you know, the boys, three boys were with us. Had a station wagon. How's that for going back in time. and uh, Wood panel station wagon. Yeah. Anthony, well, fake wood panel. <laughs> <laughs> so Anthony was the youngest, is the youngest. He was all the way in the back. From when we left her off from Tulsa, literally, to St. Louis, Saint Louis <laughs> there, nobody spoke. Everybody was crying. Tears in their eyes. And Anthony was bawling like a baby <laughs> all that way. Because he was the youngest and the oldest. They were really tight. So uh, I'm going to go on with this a little bit now. So, you know, Jennifer is uh, not my biological child, but I adopted her right away when we got married. Matter of fact, we had, we had moved to Virginia. I had to go back to Kentucky to complete the adoption. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went through that when we dropped her off. And then you get a few years down the road, and Robert is uh, getting recruited for baseball and colleges are recruiting them and uh, he picks the one the furthest of this the longest trip from northern Kentucky he comes to Nyack New York to the CMA school there Christian Missionary Alliance school and uh, he gets he gets out there and he he's playing his first fall baseball game in college so we drove we went we took the other two boys and our nephew Ryan and we went <clears throat> And, uh, well, first of all, when we dropped Robert off, it was just Gene and I dropping him off. And I went through all that anxiety again. I was a wreck. I'm leaving my son. <laughs> I'm getting it again. <laughs> but, so we went back for the first baseball game. And I was feeling not well, and Gene was driving, and I'm sitting in that passenger seat. We're in a van. The boys were behind me. And I'm saying to God, in my head, I'm going, this is not fair. Okay? Why am I going through this again? And not only that, I got two more back here. And Ryan, we half raised. I'll probably go through it with him. I can't stand this. Why is this going on? Why? So God says to me, can I teach you something? <laughs> go. Yes. 
He said, when you dropped Jennifer off, you went through this. Yeah, you know I did. And now you're going through it with Robert a second time in like six weeks. Yes. He says, but Jennifer's not your biological child. I said, well, you know that never made any difference to me. I adopted her right away. My whole family who was unsaved never called her a stepchild, ever. Not because I instructed them that way. They just never did. She was automatically assimilated into the family. And he says, yeah, yeah no, that's right. But, you know, and, I'm, and you feel this way about Robert. I said, yeah. He said, you feel the same, right? The one who's not your biological child and the one who is, yeah? He says, that's how I feel about you and Jesus. That was the first love revelation that I ever had about my relationship with God my Father. And that's the way He feels about every one of you. When you, when you take that into your spirit, you take that into your being, okay, there's no problem in your relationships with partners, husband, wife, or children that can't be overcome. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the overcomer right there. Is, is realizing that fact. It's not how much we love Him. It's how much He loves us. Next question. That's really good, Robert. <laughs> I, I, because I was right there in the car when this happened and then He told me, I go right back to that spot every time. It's kind of a refresher to me. Um, so another question. What are the things you did in your parenting that you believed helped your children follow the Lord from a young age into their adulthood? And we, we've talked about this often. There wasn't a, do you want to go to church today? It was, get up, we're going to church. Yeah. They, they didn't argue, we don't want to, do we have to? It wasn't something, it's like you're going to have breakfast. You don't ask every day, yeah. it's what you do, right? right? Mm -hmm. Sunday nights we had church, which meant we went to church in the morning. We went out for a nice long lunch with friends or family. We ran home, took care of a couple things, maybe had time to change clothes and get back to church for the evening service. But the evening service, all the family stayed together. So we would bring maybe a coloring book and crayons and say, you're going to sit right here and you're going to be quiet during the preaching. But during worship, you're worshiping. Right? So there were little kids and they were, they were taught that, they were told that. Um, we hung out with people from church, not exclusively, but every Friday night, couples would get together and bring all the kids and it would be loud and they would play and they would make a mess and the parents would all be sitting around playing some board game. But what I realized was we got we taught our kids how to be a part of a community. And we were there for each other, just like, I mean, it sounds real familiar, right? It's what goes on here. So your kids are getting so much by just being part of this church community and seeing the, the loving, like, I love coming down here and watching the little kids interact with the adults who aren't even their parents. Yeah, like, true. there's a closeness there already. True. And it's so important. So, when Jennifer turned 40, we threw a big party for her. And we had a lot of our ministry friends and a lot of people I'd never even met before were there. She asked if I would say a few words, and I'm unexpectedly going, all right, there's a lot of important ministry people here, and I don't want to sound like a blubbering idiot. And so God, give me words to say in front of all these people about my sweet girl. And I looked up, and God said, do you remember the prayer you prayed when she was little? You said, Jesus, fill the void that I don't know how to fill fill all those spots that I don't know how to teach her everything and Robert doesn't and certainly when she became an itinerant minister I didn't know how to teach her about that you give them the basics but I don't know what that looks like 
So he said, you prayed that prayer, and these people in this room are the gap fillers. They're the ones that I sent into her life to fill in those places you didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. So it was, it, it, it really made me stop, and I told these people that, and they're wiping tears, and they're thinking, and some of them came up to tell me the different places that they knew that God had used them to speak into her life. Awesome. So you can't be the perfect parent, mm -hmm. no. but you can pray in and stay a part of a community yes. where right. they're going to see different ones worshiping, oh, right? Yeah. right. They're sitting here. Those kids out here and listen to my cousin Joe talk about the Lord in a way that if you didn't know him, you'd be running up here going, I got to meet this man, Jesus, just because of the love he has for him. Well, the children heard that. So they're not hearing it just out of mom and dad or just out of the pastor, but they get to hear it from all of you. Which yes. makes me stop and think of the responsibility I have when I walk into a, the church true. building. Right. Wow. Yeah. right? Yeah. You don't just dodge the kids. You don't just, there's a teenager. I know they don't want to talk to me. No, you stop and talk to them. We just had a young man, a foster child in a lady's family at our church who invited two of his teenage friends to come to church with him. And she overheard him say to them, you wouldn't believe these old people there. They talk to me like they really care what I'm doing. Aww. He goes, you're going to love it. You should come with me. And they came with him. And, there, and he went home. I told you it's great up there, isn't it? Wow. People talk to you. Old people care about you. <laughs> and I'm not the oldest there. <laughs> no, but we're definitely in the group, let's face it. We were part of that group. So to me, that was one of the main things we did. And we got to raise our kids near my family. So we had a lot of younger family and cousins and everybody and, together. And that was a conscious decision because I had the opportunity to come on a job back to Syracuse at that point or to go to Northern Kentucky. Um, and the decision was all my brothers were a lot older, didn't even live in the area. They were out of town. My parents were older. I had cousins and that kind of thing. But her, fa her family was younger. The, the four children in her family were closer in age. Her parents were younger. And that was a conscious decision. And I, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was a God-led decision mm -hmm. to be near family so the kids could grow up near family. Now, there's some crazies in the cousin ranks at both sides, not but <laughs> not you. You're yeah, you're you're on the pedestal, buddy. But even even at that, you know, it was it was all part of community, and that was very very important. Yeah, it was. And there were times when we had to go. No, you can't go stay at that person's house. It's just not going to happen. Right. Even if they are family. Trust me, nobody's listening to me on Facebook. Even if they are family, you're not staying there. Okay, let's move on because we have a couple more. Yeah, it's almost 8 o'clock. How do, what time do you stop? Ten minutes ago? That's my life story. Have I gone over? No. No? I'm okay. A few more minutes. We have a couple really good questions. I'm, I'm not in a real big hurry tonight because the spot is closed and there's no more sugar-free cheesecake. So. You're right. You're right, Lisa. How do you maintain pure intimacy on all levels, spiritually, emotionally, physically, as you age in your marriage? Take it, Robert. <laughs> How do you maintain pure intimacy on all levels? Well, first of all, you respect each other at every level, number one. Okay, like... Uh, the wife jokes? No. Uh-uh. So if there's, if there's mutual respect and it's built on the foundation, like I said before, of, of commitment, that's what I call love is commitment. That's what God did with us. He committed to us. What did he commit? A way for us to spend eternity with him. A way for us to be with him, to be family with him through his son. Right? That was commitment. 
I don't imagine it was very easy for God to watch what happened to Jesus those last three, four days of his life. I really don't. I remember the Passion movie, um, and it showed a tear dropping out of this, out of heaven when he was on the cross and when he took him down. I, I, I believe that's probably pretty accurate that that was God's emotion at the time. So that commitment is there. That's your foundation, right? And then there's mutual respect. So you, you will get off track. We all do. The pressures of work, the pressures of bills to be paid, and you know the projects that we get involved with, and the overcommitment to other things. We talked about this. You know, uh, I know that's a question that's going to come up about balance between uh, your family life, your work life, and your church life. So church is always, there's projects going on. I mean, this whole place is a project, right? I mean, it's amazing. Totally amazing. And, but that's true in every church. So, you, you know, you're part of that church family and you commit and you, you volunteer. But you've got to be careful to not do it at the cost of your relationship with your family. It's very important. So sometimes there's a very important word that you have to have in your vocabulary. It's only two letters. No. I can't do it. I don't have the time. Okay? That you have to be able to say that. And you might the pastor might not be happy about it, or the head of that ministry might not be happy about it, but you make it up some other time or some other way. But your family, your that unit is more important than a church building. Okay? I, now, I'm sorry, but it is. Okay. I know Chris is out there probably. But saying, balance. So right? Balance. Yeah. So it's not our four and no more and we're going to make sure we're doing everything. We have family board night. We have this night. We have that night. We don't have time for church. That's not good. That's no. not teaching your kids about being a part of the community and, and helping, right? I said church building. Yeah. So it's the <laughs> overcommitment yeah. to the neglect of your family, which comes, your time with the Lord comes first, your time for your family comes next, and then you come and you help here. Now, our life here is so intertwined with our family life that you're not here enough say, don't do it because you have to take care of your family and use it as an excuse because there's so much to be gained by, and I don't even like the word serving, but being involved in the church life. There's so much to be gained by that and so much that your children will learn. But don't overcommit. The same way, don't freak out having a spotless house to the point that nobody's comfortable being there and your children would rather be in church because you make them nuts at home cleaning up every little speck. And, you know... My mother used to say, I go to Jean's house. If I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, I come back, she's made the bed already. <laughs> Which was a little true, but I thought she was up for the night. So, um, so you have to be able to bend a little, right? You get a balance in your life. That's what's so important. But then... Now you can get to the age where your kids are grown, your kids are doing more on their own. They don't need you every minute. So sometimes you think, well, I can volunteer to do more. And all of a sudden, the little poking, nitpicking at each other starts, and you go, we have not had time together, and I put everything else above us, and we got to get this balance back. We've got to get back to a place where we have time for us yeah. and other things have to wait or I have to make sure that I'm not saying yes to something God had no intention of me saying yes to. And mercy motivated people, of course, are prone to overcommit, you know, and try to take the place of God in, pe in other people's lives. And that's yes. important to, to remember and to, to not fall into that trap. But. So I think there's one last thing, because the kids are coming in, yeah. that I'm going to have you answer 
a question that I have, but first I'm going to give my perspective on this. So Robert, Robert made a decision for his business that we didn't talk about. And I found out about it at a meeting with these people. And as the man said, I'm so excited about your five-year commitment, I plastered a smile on my face going, what is he talking about? This is, this is, three, year, this is three years ago. Three years ago. <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, oh, oh. And I'm waiting for him to acknowledge, oh, geez, sorry, I didn't talk to you. Nothing. He went, yeah, I'm excited. Okay. And I'm ready to say something. And God said, don't say a word. So miracle of miracles, I didn't say a word. And we got in the, we got in the car to, get, to go home. And I thought, now he's going to bring it up. And he didn't say a word. Wasn't that fun tonight? It was. It was just a knife full of surprises. Yeah, it was good to see. I'm like, I didn't know any of those people. I wasn't surprised. We get home, not a word. Next morning, not a word. I'm like, God, today, don't say a word. A week goes by, he never brought it up. I'm not kidding. I'm like, God, seriously, you're asking me to stay quiet about this for a week when you know I'm right and I don't get to drive it home? And then, miracle of miracles, again, I forgot about it for a time. I looked at the date later, one month to the day. We're sitting in the living room, being the precious wife I am. I said, honey, would you like a cup of decaf coffee? I'll go make some. And he said, I'd love a cup. I said, okay. And I get up, and as I'm walking by his chair, his lightning fast mind went, you know what? I never explained about that five-year commitment, did I? I was flabbergasted. I sat down on the arm of his chair, ready to say, it only took you a month to remember. But instead, God spoke through this mouth. And this is what I said. You're up way before me every single morning, reading the word, praying, talking to God. If I can't trust that you felt peace to make that decision out of that relationship with God, then what difference does any of it make? And I got up and I walked in the kitchen going, what? <laughs> <laughs> what did I just say? And I, we have a window that I can see into the living room. And I'm not kidding. He had this look on his face like, wow, that did not go the way I thought it was going to go. But I realized something 42 years of marriage. I don't want anything else but that. I want to know that my husband, now men, you think, what do women want? All the Mars and Venus and all that goofy stuff. Here's what we want. We want a man who's seeking after God for him, for me, and for our family. That's what we want, because everything else is taken care of in that. Yeah. Yeah. So men take the pressure off of trying to do everything else and just get that one thing right, and everything else will fall into line. And let your kids know that's what you're doing. All right, so I just want to say something to the men. You might have something, the words of wisdom for the women. So, that was my word of wisdom for the women. You might have more. Once more. You're never, you're never short of words. So That's true. Me. That's true. So, or wisdom. So, Thank you. Uh, no, Thank really, you. really. Well, you got out of that hole real quick. Go ahead. It's 8.06. It'll soon be 11.11 11 well, and Chris will be calling. Will I get a cup of coffee tonight? <laughs> you will get a cup of decaf. All right. Did you still get the same? <laughs> <laughs> There's a throwback. I'm surprised you're old enough to know. <laughs> no, I just, to the men, um, you know, when the kids were young and we were raising them and, and all that was going on, uh, the church was sending mission groups to Mexico to build churches and orphanages. And uh, I never got a word from God about going. And that was fine. 
but they would come back from their missions trip, you know, and the church is a pretty good-sized church, and they'd have the men come up and testify about what went on, and everybody be, yeah, rah, 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 and it was great, and the things they were doing were phenomenal. I'm not speaking anything against that. But God spoke to me about, because I, I was like, you know, Lord, you know, am I ever going to go? He said, but he said, let me tell you something. Your mission field is in the four walls of your house. And so is every other man's. That's, that's great that they go. But you've got to take care of this mission field first. And that stuck with me forever. And I, would, you, I realized I didn't have the right to walk out of my door to go to work in the morning or anywhere else without praying for my family before I walked out the door. I do it to this day. I get in the truck, I pull out of the garage, and I sit there and I wait until I pray. And my prayer is a lot different than it was back then. Okay, Because hopefully I've grown in the Lord. But the point is, I pray. I pray over my house, my household. I include, obviously, Jean, my children, their spouses, and my grandchildren. Okay, That's important. Very important. I'm going to leave you with this because... It's always a big joke about how busy Jean is and the stuff that she takes on and the things that she does. And I get that. That's okay. God's graced me to handle a lot. Sometimes I go way overboard, even by my standard. But um, So in the midst of our pastor's dinner, our daughter saying I'm supposed to be there, me seeing the other meeting, um, Francois the Mirror Bible Translator, put on Facebook, if you would like one of the new Mirror Bibles, contact our precious friends, Jean and Robert Tringale, and here's her email, and she'll ship you a Mirror Bible. So I'm on a 10-day babysitting stint in Kentucky at the time, coming back to all this stuff happening, and my inbox is flooded. I'm like, I know we talked about it, but I didn't know that was happening now. So then he's telling me boxes are arriving, and I, the man's very discerning. So from South Africa, he picks up on maybe Gene's feeling a little stressed by this responsibility. And he said something to me that in a message, so I want you to hear this message only because he said something that I want to hear. I want you all to see if you pick up on it. Perfect. Even Tuesday, my you dear know? sister, you guys should take a day or two off to rest after this incredibly busy week and weekend coming. So um, don't, don't, don't rush. Just do it in, in the perfect, unforced rhythms of his grace. I'm in the middle of all of this stuff going, how am even I going to get all this done? And I listened to that. <laughs> the unforced rhythms of his grace. I never wanted a tattoo. Now I do. And I need it like right here, right? So that I can see. But what a beautiful way to go through every aspect of your life. Just God I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to do it when you tell me to do it. I'm not going to do anything more, but this is it. So I even looked it up in the Passion Translation, and because I like that too. But this was in um, Matthew. Did you move my marker? No. no. Here it is. Matthew 11:28. Are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me. I will refresh your life, for I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways, and you'll discover that I'm gentle, humble, easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. So I think when it's unpleasant and not easy to bear is when we get over into our own plan. Yeah. 
and our own agenda, and we say yes because we know they need help, so we'll say yes, and we can't say no. So again, just <laughs> let God direct it. Chill out when it comes to raising your kids. Don't be so intense. When you screw up, sit down and talk to them about it. If it affects them, if you screwed up in front of them, purpose in your heart to not do it again. But just stay in that place of rest in your marriage too, right? Amen. So just remember, to believe is to trust. And faith is very important. But we, I think sometimes we focus too much on our faith and not the faith of God. So just keep that in mind. Make sure that you're always trusting the word. You trust the logos. Yeah. Very, very critical. So let's just pray. Yeah. So Father, we thank you that we've had the opportunity to fellowship together tonight. And that anything, we just pray that what we said will impart, be imparted to this audience here, that whoever needed any part of this has received it, and that it will make a difference in their life, and make a difference in their family, make a difference in their children, and, and even their relationships with adult parents and other members of the family. It's so important. And Father, we thank you that, we, that this is all orchestrated by you, and that God, we love you, and we are just moving forward into our identity, knowing, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt, we are your children, your sons and your daughters. You are the perfect father. Yes. You are the perfect parent. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Amen. There it is. Um, so, I have a few thoughts and they'll be quick, I promise. Um, one, if you have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, because a lot of the time, I'm not married and I don't have kids. So don't shut your ears off. I, that's the one thing I had to teach myself is when people talk if I shut my ears off because it doesn't apply to me directly right now yeah. you're not going to hear what the spirit is saying right, right. True. and that's something I've had to I literally have had to teach myself not to disconnect right. because if I don't hear it what they're saying I could take what they're saying for me for my future but God is multifaceted. You could take what they're saying for your spiritual children as well. And that's how, personally, the faith and family nights, that's how I get through. Because I hear for my spiritual children and for my children in the future. So don't think because you're not in the season yet doesn't mean you can't learn anything. You have to hear through the Spirit and let the Spirit interpret what may not apply to you right now, like in the natural. That's right. That's right. And I love, I love this couple. They are probably the most progressive people I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> no, for real. You, you are the embodiment of what it's like to move with the Spirit and what it is to not condemn what you don't understand but to seek God for what you don't understand. Every single time. I, I listen to them, I'm like, oh, they're just amazing. And that's why our body and our family is so amazing is because everyone from every age can learn from everyone. When I first came to this church, I had that thought too. None of the old people really want to talk to me. But that was quickly changed. Very fast. <laughs> Second thing is, Sunday morning, it's Easter Sunday, y'all. Like, <laughs> it's it's. Uh, I encourage you, invite people to come. Not because it's Easter. Not because everyone knows they're like, oh, it's Easter, we should go. It's because the resurrected Christ came out of the grave, and we now have new life. 
and the kingdom of God is present now, growing, and has and will bear fruit. So I just hope that all of you just pray about that person that you want to invite so that way they can meet the resurrected Christ and join the beautiful family that he purchased. It's, a, it's, a, it's more than just, oh, he, he rose out of the grave. No, he was raised for our justification. So that way we can be innocent and blameless and spotless before him. And it's, Amy's just going to, oh, I can't wait. You're going to bring it. <laughs> so 10 a.m., come ready to celebrate the resurrected Christ. I don't want to be the loudest person in the room. I don't. I don't. I, I'm challenging you. If you've never been loud once, it's time to unlock the treasure that's inside. It's time to celebrate and let your body and your soul come under the subjection of the resurrection that is now laid inside of our spirits. So that way we can, they'd be like, wow, they're so happy because they're in church. No, we're happy because we've met the resurrected Christ. Amen. Amen. See you on Sunday.